so your controls are wild, wild type mice, right? Do you feed them the same NR? And yeah, do you see? So do you have any controls without um, NR? And do, do you see the wild type mice do better because they're getting NR? Yeah, the wild type mice do better. The wild type the wild type mice live longer, in that measure. So we and other uh, into other studies clearly see that it, there is a lifespan extending effect of NAD supplementation with, say, NR in wild type mice. We've also seen lifetime ex uh, extension in, in in various other mouse models, but in simple wild type, and I just uh, published that very recently in a study where we also looked at smelling. Mm -hmm. And and we have been doing studies with smelling and hearing, which are also very important processes that we could maybe discuss a little. Uh, in these in these experiments, uh, what what kind of dose are you giving for the NR, and and how are you giving it to the mice? Yeah, so we try to use doses that mimic relatively what a human would get. So for mm -hmm. NR, the, the high dose that people are using in, in current clinical studies would be two grams per day. Mm -hmm. And then we scale that down to mouse based on weight. And so we can, we, we try to mimic per weight what how much we give a mouse. Right. So you, so you don't you don't use the allosteric conversion like the 12 point, I mean the number I see on the web is like 12 point three i think um me yeah yeah no not not exactly but it, it uh it, i think there are different ways of doing this my understanding is that because you know like the metabolism of mice is so much quicker than you know yeah. they, they just use nr quicker and so you know i see the number of you divide by 12.3 to four grams per kilogram for humans yeah do you yeah. do a do you do a conversion like that or or not? Because I'm very interested we, to understand how valid that is. Yes, I, I I I I think it might depend on various things. So, firstly, we 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 do more of the conversion based on how much does a what a mouse weigh relative to how much a human weighs, right? So right. A mouse weighs thirty grams, and and so and, and a human weighs seventy kilograms or more. But mm. uh, but really, we also uh, in many experiments, try with different doses mm. of these interventions. So sometimes it's it's a little uh, it's challenging because there are various ways of doing it. The best is to try different doses, obviously, if you can. Yeah. No, I would like to talk now about yeah hearing loss. So and and this is so you looked at kind of age related hearing loss. Is, is that yeah we. I've looked at the, it's, it started with so the different kinds of hearing loss. One is based more on the mechanistics of the inner ear function, and one is based more on the nervous transduction in the inner ear. And the, that one is called sensorineural hearing loss. And that's the one that's seen in, in aging uh, and which is very severely a big problem in the population because most people lose hearing with time and it's very fast progressing very fast in the population and and with age and it's a big problem because if you lose hearing you lose skill uh, communication you lose other things that are very important in your quality of life so mm -hmm. hearing is uh, hearing and also smelling are two very important senses for 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 uh, for quality of life, um, there there is a interestingly hearing is also since it's a nervous uh, degeneration like in the brain it's it's part of it is a neurodegeneration, and so in in some mice we <coughs> study uh, that mimic diseases in in humans. We, we actually see a hearing loss also like we see in humans. So we started our work with looking at some 
rare genetic disorders that, and I, as I mentioned before, I have to do with uh, premature aging. So patients appear much older than they actually are, and it seems to be a, a clearly a, a, a accelerated aging process. And we looked at hearing in these mice, and we uh, found that uh, th there was a dramatic loss of hearing with aging, and that we could stem that loss completely with N N NAD supplementation, the my riboside, even with a short treatment of it. But I should say that it's it's not like we, again, cure it, but we stem the further loss. So if we get in early in these mice and we treat, we they don't have a hearing loss for as long as we kept it going. Why is magnesium important? Magnesium plays many crucial roles in the body, such as supporting muscle and nerve function and energy production. To ensure that we have sufficient magnesium, my wife and I take magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers. Do you know that there are two options to use magnesium breakthrough to support your health? I take magnesium breakthrough at night to help with muscle recovery, avoid cramps, and have more peaceful sleep. My wife takes one capsule in the morning instead which she finds makes her more calm and focused at her work. One of the important reasons we chose Magnesium Breakthrough is it has the full spectrum of seven types of magnesium, and it's made with all natural ingredients, soy-free, gluten-free, lactose-free, non-GMO, free of chemicals and fillers. To support your wellness, simply visit magnesiumbreakthrough.com modern and use the code modern10 to get your Magnesium Breakthrough with a 10% discount. Thank you for your support. And, and this was then a specific genetic mouse model, but it led to that we have used a number of other mouse models now in studies of what happens with normal aging. So in these different mice, we see a loss of hearing uh, with aging different frequencies of hearing, and we see a, a significant uh, improvement meaning um, less loss if you treat them with nicotinamide riboside. And we, we, we think that um, this relates to the function of the nerves in the inner ear, and we can directly measure the, how it works on the nerves, including what we call synaptic transmission. So between two nerves, we have a synapse between them, and that's how they connect with different neurotransmitters and, and signaling process between two nerves. And, and, and a very strong effect of nicotinamide riboside, in addition to the others that I mentioned, is that it stimulates in various ways this synaptic transmission. And we have seen that under various conditions. We've seen it measured as function or measured as a way where you look at proteins and signaling processes. And so that we think is a major way that it works on the hearing process. Would smelling be similar? I mean, smelling is, it's also a neural thing. Yeah. Yeah, so smelling is definitely a neural thing as well. And here we have the neurons that detect smelling in the top of your nose, here in the nose, and they are very uh, also vulnerable and particularly vulnerable to things like DNA damage. If you smell things and all the kind of things that are in the air and, and, and toxins, they directly damage those neurons that control the smelling. So the processes of smelling and, and hearing are, are very different, but there are also similarities. And, and I think what really has interested me for many years is that uh, in particular, smelling is a much more profound sense than we normally realize. We know that memory is connected to sense of smelling. We know that uh, uh, in, in, in the mice, for example, uh, they involve large parts of their brains in the smelling sense. So it's a very complicated, very involved process. And I think we would do good as humans to 
be more interested in smelling and more refined ways to determine smelling and to relate it to, to other things. Uh, so we were very interested in, in this process for a long time and, and smelling is involves uh, various steps. You can talk about how strong you can smell different substances. You can talk about how soon you smell it, how long it lingers, and all kinds of steps in the smelling process. And we just published a, a, a paper on this where we looked at the sense of smelling in, relating to, in relation to aging and, and could also show in this work that loss of a, some smelling sense is an early process in aging before we see other changes with aging that are more motor dependent or something. So smelling is an early change in, in mice with smelling. Um, the smelling is an early uh, with aging. Um, and actually, um, we did see a little benefit there of uh, NAD supplementation as well, but uh, not as strong as we see with hearing. And you know that smelling is a, very significant, uh, significantly connected specifically to Parkinson. So smelling loss is one of the earliest and most significant features in, in developing Parkinson's disease. And also may be important in Alzheimer's, although not as well established. So again, we, we're interested in how early in the process of developing Alzheimer's do you lose smelling? and can improvement of spelling then improve uh, the process of, of, uh, of uh, intervention against Alzheimer's. Are you looking at trialing like um, NR as a hearing aid? Well, not as a hearing aid, I guess yeah. as, as a way of slowing hearing loss. Yeah, I or am definitely trying to do that. I don't have an established uh, I think there's an interest in it in, in many, many places. So we're trying to do something with clinical intervention here, clearly. Yeah. I just w wondered what kind of time frame would you need to work over, though? I mean, <laughs> yeah. to, to yeah, see the difference. A, yeah, I, that's, a, that's one of the questions that, that, is, that are challenging with this. So that could be over a long span of time and that becomes uh, challenging to to give people these things over a long period of time. So we're trying to work out what the best ideas would be. I mean, we, we see some uh, benefits in some of these conditions even with very short period of time in that uh, hearing test that, that I mentioned uh, in the genetic mouse model. Uh, we see an effect after just a, a week of of treatment with us. But in terms of uh, the long term and keeping going with this, you would, of course, need a much longer period of time. Many of the clinical studies that have been done currently with nicotinamide riboside or other NAD supplementation have only been for max one year and most of them much shorter. Hmm. So I think one of the things we are waiting for is just to see for safety that taking NAD supplementation over many years will have no side effects. It looks like it doesn't have any significant side effects, at least up to a month or a year. Will it have any side effects if we take it for many more years? Uh, but uh, we're trying to devise a good way of testing it without taking it for too long in the, in the case of hearing.